hired and fired. I want to speak for just a moment in some terms that may be disruptive to some of you, and I apologize for that at the outset, but I want to, to touch a cultural icon. I've lost count of how many times I've put on a Class A uniform, got with a, another soldier also in a Class A uniform, walked up to a door and knocked on it and changed somebody's world. Doing what we called a casualty notification. The Secretary of Defense regrets to inform you that your loved one has been killed. Not happy news for our soldiers' families. Can you imagine getting the knock on that door and finding out that it was a guy that was trying to get elected that led the action that killed your loved one. You see, David has found himself as a friend of the Philistines. And he's been sneaking around and killing people that weren't Philistines and weren't Israelites in his raids down into the Negev. We looked at that last week, but he's going to find himself now in a position where the Philistines are going to go to war with the Israelites. And he's got to figure out a way not to be that guy. Because if he helps the Philistines now and kills Israelites, when it comes time for him to become the king, there will be Israelite families who lost sons to him and his action. If he doesn't side with the Philistines, they're going to recognize that he's been lying to them this whole time and they're going to kill him and his band of 600. So as we come to this chapter 28 and 29 this morning, it's absolutely imperative that we have this vision of David and this 600 as a special operations unit that's been active behind enemy lines for all of this time that is suddenly coming into a crisis where they're going to get busted out. If, if I can put that another way, it's like having an undercover cop that's embedded in the mafia who's now being asked to murder someone. And he's got this crisis of how do I maintain this ruse that I've got going on and not hurt innocent people. Okay, So as we look at this story, I want us to have that freshly in mind. I wish that I could preach four chapters today because this is one story. This is the beginning of the end for Saul. Chapters 28, 29, 30, and 31 will end 1 Samuel because that is where we will end Saul. And 2 Samuel, we begin with the kingship of David. So we're at this transition point where Saul as king is stepping out and David as king is stepping in. And he's gotten to this 11th hour. He doesn't know that this is the 11th hour, but he's come to this final act before he takes kingship. And he has a massive decision to make to protect the kingship he's going to get or betray his own people. In those days, the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish, king of the Philistines, of the city of Gath, said to David, you must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. David said, then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. I mean, he's got a reputation as a warrior. He's been bringing booty that he's captured from his raid 
to Achish. Achish has never seen him in battle. He's heard the rumors about Goliath, who was from the city of Gath. He knew about Goliath being killed, but he may not have been at the battle that day. And so David is like, you know i got a reputation. You take me into battle, you'll get to see what I really can do. I wonder what David was thinking. Was he thinking, yeah, you're going to see how I can fight as I kill you and your guys. Or was he actually contemplating some other way of demonstrating? But he's still talking smack. I want you to see this. He's still in Achish's servant. He has been given a city. He has become the liege lord underneath Achish. He has been a servant. And I'll remind you that chapter 27 ended with Achish saying to himself, David has become so odious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant forever. He's got this mindset that David's going to serve him. And David is still telling him that. Then you'll get to see for yourself what your servant can do. Achish replied, <laughs> very well. Because he was concerned, you know. He comes to David, this general of Israel, and says, hey, we're going to Israel and we're going to be fighting some of the guys you train. And he was expecting David to go, well, I don't know, and cause a problem. <laughs> David's just like, I can skewer them just as easy. Let's go. Very well, Achish says. I will make you my bodyguard for life. He just promoted him to head of the Secret Service. You're not just going to go into battle. Your job is going to be to keep me alive in the battle. Because kings go to battle. And so David is now given the ultimate responsibility. Verse 3, Now Samuel was dead. Thank you. That's been a truth since three chapters ago. But it's important to recognize who's leading Israel. Saul. Who's giving the guidance to the people as to what God has going on? Who was that again? Because Samuel's not there anymore. And who's been made high priest? And how much influence does the high priest have? Because you don't have the tabernacle in Jerusalem or anywhere near the leadership and the, the church has been split up and there's not a real good religious voice to answer for the Lord. Samuel's dead. And all Israel had mourned him and buried him in his own town of Rabbah. So we're in this time of transition. There's no spiritual leadership. And Saul has expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Now this is key because he's actually done the right thing. He said, we don't want to have any of this going on. <sighs> Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31, very quickly. I just want to read this verse to you. Leviticus 19 and 31. Do not turn to mediums or seek out spiritists, for you will be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. If you want an answer as to what's coming up, you don't go find somebody that can read palms, look at a crystal ball, move their Ouija board, flip their tarot cards. You don't go to mediums and spiritists. You pray, I am the Lord your God. Pretty straightforward. So Saul goes, you know what? We don't need any mediums or spiritists in the land. Well done, Saul. Or, or, or maybe we could look at Exodus chapter 22. And in Exodus chapter 22 and verse 18, we find, <laughs> do not allow a sorceress to live. Whoa. Not just get rid of them, get rid of them. Wow. Okay. Or, or maybe we go back to Leviticus to chapter 20 and verse 6. I will set my face against the person who turns to mediums and spiritists to prostitute himself by following them, and I will cut him off from his people. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a Bible picture going on here. 
Mediums and spiritists, God says, no, and not only no, if you have someone that is practicing that, kill them, and if you have somebody that is going to them to get information, kill them too. This is a death penalty act. I am God, I am the only God, I am the only place you get answers. So Saul has actually done the right thing here. Saul has actually pulled out and said, okay, mediums and spiritists completely clear the land, there's none in the land, good, we've done something holy. That's just kind of giving you some background as we jump back into verse 4. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all the Israelites and set up camp at Gilboa. Then Saul saw the Philistine army. He was afraid. Terror filled his heart. (laughs) You know, it's pretty bad when you bring a knife to a gunfight. And Saul is realizing what he's done. He's realizing he's outgunned, outmanned, and he is terrified. He inquired of the Lord. The Lord didn't answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Gee, really, Saul? You're going to kick God to the curb constantly? You're going to be following everything God told you not to do. You're going to try to lead the kingdom on your own. You're going to constantly... And you expect Him to answer the phone when you do call? He's like, okay, God, I'm in a bad situation here. What are you going to do about it? Crickets. Oh, man. I've got myself in a bad place here. And I've made God mad enough He won't talk to me anymore. Saul then said to his attendants, verse 7, find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. Oh, Saul. There is one in Endor, they said. Now this... This, this is humorous to me. The king has said, there shall be no more spirituals or mediums. We're kicking them all out. We're honoring God. No more. The land is clear. Look at us. This is my, I mean, this is one of his campaign things. We got rid of all the mediums and spiritists in Israel. And they're all like, yeah. And he goes, wait a minute. I need one. And a dude in his staff knows where they can find one. It's like, you know, everybody talks about, yeah, we're getting we're getting rid of the homeless, but everybody can tell you what street they live on. You know, we're 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 cleaning up the town, we're we're outlawing and we're getting rid of prostitution, but everybody in town knows which lane they're on at a certain time of night. It didn't really get rid of it. It just become officially bad. I was given a word this morning, and this is just my nugget for the day for some of you. Um, Find me a woman. There's one in indoor. Because God is not answering him. Saul, at this moment, should have said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Not indoor. This was yet once more an opportunity for Saul to say, I repent. I recognize that you have turned your back on me because I have done everything wrong. I need you to heal me. I need you to restore me. I need you to make me the king that you created me to be. I have failed you multiple times. He needs to read a little bit of Psalm 51, but it hasn't been written yet. He needs that moment. But instead of repenting, instead of turning to God, he goes even further and steps off the cliff. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes, and at night he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, Surely you know what Saul has done. He has cut off the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Okay, so here's, 
Saul set the law up according to the Scripture, and now he's kind to get this woman to do something for him that he outlawed because God outlawed it. And she's like, time out. You're trying to get me killed. Saul swore by to her by the Lord. Oh, please recognize that that Lord is all caps. He swore to her by the name of God. Not just God, not just King, the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. So you just swore by God that God wouldn't punish something He's already outlawed. How much arrogance do you really have, Saul? How much pull do you really think you have? He just means the kingdom won't punish him. He's not thinking about God punishing her because he's not thinking about God. The woman asked, whom should I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice. This is one of those noises that Alfred Hitchcock wished he had recorded. Okay, This is the scream that makes the goosebumps come up and the heart stop a little bit. Okay, She cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. Something that was going on in that moment, she got a clearness and was able to go, you're Saul. I just got set up by the king. You just totally tricked me. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see a spirit coming out, out of the ground. What does it look like? He asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Several things. I could preach a sermon on these five verses. I could preach several of them. Let me just suffice to say, it's fascinating to me how many spiritists and mediums today are in actuality charlatans who tell you what you want to hear. I mean, if I said there was an old guy coming out of the grave dressed up in a robe, how would you possibly identify that old man in a robe from every other old man that was buried in a robe? It's the fact of the matter is you want to talk to Samuel, so, oh, it must be Samuel. And never forget that when you get that thump under the table, it's actually somebody trying to get your attention so that you can tell them the thing that you want to hear back so that, oh, that voice is uncle such and such, not just a voice. <sighs> Let that go. What's fascinating here is that we're about to have a conversation between Samuel and Saul, which means that Samuel actually did come back. And that opens up a theological can of worms I am not prepared to unpack this morning. That's probably going to wind up on a Wednesday night. Anyway, so I want to quit here in verse 14. He prostrated himself. That is, toes back, on the knees, on the elbows, on the hands, face down. This is what the Bible means when it says he prostrated himself and bowed down with his face to the ground. This is what it's talking about right here. This position. This is important because in a couple of verses he's going to change positions. Okay. Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me and God has turned away from me. He neither he no longer answers me either by prophets or by dreams. So I've called on you to tell me what to do. <laughs> Wait a minute. The job of a prophet is to speak for God. If God's not answering you, why do you keep banging on the telephone? Pro Samuel's just the telephone. You're trying to get back door to God. He's already not answering you. Why are you messing with Samuel? Uh. 
which Samuel says in verse 16. Why do you consult me? Now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy, I work for Him. I am His mouthpiece. I speak for Him. If He's not talking to you, I got nothing for you. The Lord has done what He predicted through me. Oh, this is so much fun. Look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 15, just a few pages back, because we get a side-by-side except for one detail, and that one detail is so cool. Check this out. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 28. This is back when Samuel makes the prediction that God is taking away the kingdom of Israel. Look at verse 28. Look at verse 17. The Lord has done what He predicted back then. Start the quote. The Lord has torn the kingdom. The Lord will tear the kingdom. Has has torn the kingdom of Israel out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors. That is exactly what it says back there. Except at that point it goes to one better than you. Because at this point He hadn't named David because he didn't want Saul to kill David. And he didn't want all of these chapters that have been going on since then to happen. But now, check this out. Back in 1 Samuel 28, he's given it to one of your neighbors, to David. (laughs) Even coming up from the grave, Samuel knows what's happening. David's finally king, and you're toast, buddy. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out His fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. 17 and 18 is the direct quote of what He prophesied way back in chapter 15. Because that's the only word He had. Here's the word from the Lord. Here's the word from the Lord again. Call me back from the dead, I'll tell it to you again. It doesn't change. The Lord will hand over, verse 19 of chapter 28, the Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. (laughs) Now, where's where's Samuel? He did. He's in that holding place that the Israelites called paradise or Abram's bosom waiting for the judgment. And so you know, this is all pre-cross, so there is this place. And he's saying, you guys are going to be with me tomorrow night. So Saul instantly knows he's dead. He's not going to survive this. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistine. Not only have you lost you, you've lost your sons, and you've lost the nation to the neighbors because of your evil. As I said, you're toast. Immediately, Saul fell full length on the ground. He's in this little ball and he just collapses. He's just flat out on the floor now. He falls full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. He was terrified by the army he saw. Now he's just heard the verdict again. And he knows. You know, I've had people come up to me and say, you know, I sometimes wish I knew when I was going to die so I could you know, plot and plan and do some things between now and then. No, I don't think you would. Saul just got told, you're within 24 hours, son. Pack your bags. And he can't move off the floor. His strength was gone. For he'd eaten nothing all that day and night. And when the woman came to Saul and saw that he was greatly shaken, I love this, this little piece that lets us know, when this thing started, she bailed. She didn't want anything to do with what was going on in that room. So once she saw, he's there, you guys are, I'm out. 
And I got too quiet in that room. And she comes back to see what's going on. And saw that he was greatly shaken. She said, look, your maidservant has obeyed you. I took my life in my hands and did what you told me to do. Now please listen to your servant and let me give you some food so you may eat and have the strength to go on your way. He refused, but I will not eat. But his men joined the women in, er, in the woman in urging him, and he listened to them. He got up from the ground and sat on the couch. The woman had a fattened calf at the house, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. Then she set it before Saul and his men, and they ate. And that same night, they got up and left. So we've got this whole thing with Endor going on, but we started with the battle lines are formed, and he goes to Endor, and now he's coming back to these battle lines to fight. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, chapter 29. As we open chapter 29, we're back to the beginning of chapter 28, talking about what's happening on the Philistine side. So now we've got a vision from chapter 28 on what was happening on the Israelite side. Now we're going to look at the Philistine side. And the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. Wait a minute. Those are different words than 28. Must have found another problem in Scripture. No, you found a problem with your atlas. Again, help, let me help you understand this. Mick, if you will, please go back and, and put up the uh, map for me. Um, the Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek, and Israel camped by the spring in Jezreel. And as the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Achish. So you've got then... We're going to wind up where we started in verse 28, but verse, or chapter 28, now chapter 29 is going back one more step and saying when the five cities of Philistines got together, they met at Aphek, not at the battleground. This is a map, modern day, of the Jezreel Valley. This area right here is the Jezreel Valley. Um, and so this right here down at the bottom is Mount Gilboa. And so they're talking about the Israelites being right here by Gadona at the base of Gilboa, and they're going to wind up at the spring of Jezreel, which is right there on the modern map. It's Yitzrael, Y-I-Z-R-E hyphen E-L. That's Jezreel. Right there. So the Israelites are sitting right there in this flat valley, and Sunam is up here. So the Philistines are going to wind up here. Now there's something that I really want you to see in this because it's kind of fascinating. All the Israelites are down here. All the Philistines are marching into this battlefield up here. They're going to fight right in this area. And check this out. He actually leaves camp to go to Endor. Pull it down just a touch, babe. There is Endor. So he literally had to cross behind enemy lines to go all the way up here to get the information that he got from Samuel, which was, you should have stayed at camp. Why are you bothering me? So he has to go completely around the Philistines to get up here, and now he's got to get all the way back. That's why he hadn't eaten anything for a day and an evening. Because they were sneaking through the weeds trying to not get caught by the Philistines as they were going up there to get information that they didn't need to go get anyway. So Endor is up there. The Israelites are set up here. Pull down just a touch. Go north for us, please. Do you see that word right there that says Nazareth? That's where Jesus grew up. Up on the hillsides looking over the Jezreel Valley. Uh, by the way, pull the map a little to the east, please. Uh, a little more. A little more. 
Wait a minute, I've missed it somewhere. Go north. Slide up, slide up, slide up, slide up. Up, up, up. Go the other way. Mickey, stop. Slide up. Thank you, stop. There it is. So we're right here. The Israelites are over here. Slide slide back to that way a little bit, baby. Stop. Too far. We started here. Israel, Philistines, slide west. Yep, 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 yep. See that town right there? It's right there at the head of the Jezreel Valley. It's a little town called Megiddo. It's on the edge of a mountain. Mountain in Hebrew is Har. Thus, the battle at Har Megiddo, or Armageddon, is in the Jezreel Valley. It's the best place in that part of the world to fight. Great big open plain. Wars have gone on here forever. Okay, now go to the northwest, please. Way up here. Stop. Come. Where is it? Uh, get me to the beat. I can't see where Tel Aviv. Am I north of Tel Aviv or south of it? Back out a little bit, babe. There it is. Keep keep coming up. There it is. Right there. There is Aphek. So all of the Philistines are clear up here at Aphek, and they're about to march down to the south and east to go over to the Jezreel Valley. And it's when he sees them all marching into the valley that he panics and runs around them and goes up to Endor. And by the time they've gotten back down and we get to chapter 29, we've gotten to the places that we talked about. Now, one more thing here. If you will, please just back straight out. Keep going, keep going. Keep me in, keep me in Israel. Keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going. All the way out. I want to see the south. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. One more, that's good. We're talking about, there's Nazareth, so the Jezreel Valley is right there. You see down here is Be'er Shiva? Right there is Ziklag. So when David and his guys left Ziklag to go to battle, they had to go all the way up to here. So when we get into this chapter, they're going to go all the way back down which hopefully that makes some sense to you. Thank you, babe. All right, so the Philistines have gathered at Aphek and they're marching into the battleground and the Philistines are already set at Jezreel. And as they marched in with their hundreds and their thousands, David and his men were marching with them at the rear with Achish. And the commanders of the Philistines, the other four kings, there are five kings in the Philistines. Gath is one of the five. So Achish is one out of a group. The commanders, the other four, asked, uh, what about these Hebrews? We're going into battle with the Hebrews and you're bringing a contingency of 600 Hebrews. This seems like a bad plan, Achish. What, what's going on here? Is this not David, who was an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He's already been with me for over a year and from the day he left Saul until now, I have had no fault with him. Dude, we have a small army here that knows how they fight. He's been faithful to me. He's going to slaughter a mess of them in ways we don't even know how. He knows their weak spots. He trained half the guys over there. This is a great move. But the Philistine commanders were angry with him and said, send the man back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us into battle or he will turn against us during the fighting. (laughs) They're reading the handwriting on the wall. (laughs) Like, no, 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 no. We are not going to have David in our rear while we've got Israel to our front. This is dumb. We'll all die. You can't bring him. How better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men. Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands? So Achish called David and said to him, Surely as the Lord lives, you've been reliable and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until now, I have found no fault in you. But the I love you, man! 
You're my bud. You and me. But these guys over here, they won't let me take you with us. The other kings, they won't let you come. So turn back and go in peace and do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. You gotta love how David plays this. What have I done? What, what, what have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And he said, I know you've been as pleasing in the eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, Philistine commanders have said, he must not go up with us into battle. Now get up early along with your master's servants who have come with you and leave in the morning as soon as it's light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went up to Jezreel. I'm going to grab one verse out of chapter 30. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. It takes them almost three full days to march all the way back down. By the way, I'm going to save that for next week. I'm just going to drop that. He got himself hired as bodyguard and he got fired before he could ever go to battle. But I want you to see something else that's going on here. David's about to get hired as king and Saul just got fired for real. This is the transition point. I always try to define some reason, application for us today. You might find yourself in a place like David. Whether the Lord put you there or whether your own stupid decisions got you there, but you might find yourself needing a way out. You might find yourself in a position where you've led yourself into a set of decisions that you don't want to make. God always provides a way out. He always provides that way out. David didn't have to come up with this, by the way. I mean, I can just imagine as they were marching along and Achish calls him over to him, he was expecting to get the battle orders of exactly how he was supposed to kill and he was thinking to himself, how am I going to handle this? I mean, if I attack Achish, I'm in the rear, but at the same time, I'm surrounded by Philistines. There's no way I get home. I can't get away from them to get to the Israelites. Even if I went to the Israelites, I don't know if Saul would see me coming at them and think I was friend or foe. How in the world do I get myself out of this? I'm marching along kicking rocks trying to think, how in the world do I solve this? I get 600 men behind me going, hey, what are you doing? Hey, David, we're t I'm not killing Israel. David! He's marching his troops when I know, shh. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. No, he's a good officer. He'd never say that. God's got a plan. I just don't know what it is. How many of you can re reflect with that? God's got a plan. I just don't know what it is. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us whether David was talking to God or not whether he was crying out to God or not. But I'll bet he was. I see the way he writes the Psalms. And some of those Psalms were written during this time period. And he's writing to God and he's praying to God. And I'm sure that he was crying out to God. To say, I need an out. I've gotten myself here. I've been doing great things for the kingdom. I've been working for Israel. But this thing's about to bite me. I need an out. You see, unlike Saul, who should have said, why hast thou forsaken me? Please redeem me. Please, I repent. Save me. Save Israel. David's over here doing that. Lord, I don't know what to do. What do I do? What do I do? <laughs> and Achish calls him up. David, I need to see you. Sir, got some new marching orders. Yes, sir. When we get to the battle, yes, sir, you're not going to be there. What? I need you to go home. But I just marched all the way from Ziklag up here to fight the enemy because I'm going to show you that I'm... I'm what? what? I don't need you here. Why? Because they won't let you play. 
Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, my lord, I'll, I'll go back and I'll, I'll make sure that the south front is maintained. The Egyptians don't hit us while we're gone and everything will be cool. Appreciate it, Lord. Yes! Yes! I am sure when David was called to Achish, he was like, Ugh. He gets the news and he's like, ah. <laughs> He's marching back into camp and his men are going, boys been smoking something. What, David? Pack your stuff. Okay, what are we doing? We're going home. What? We're going home. I don't understand. Shut up. Pack your stuff. We're going home. God's provided the out. We have to be in touch with God to hear it when it shows up. And I mentioned this last week, and I know there's a lot of repetition with what I was saying last week, but I think it bears repeating. You always have a choice. In every situation, you always have a choice. Most of the time, you have more than two. Most of the time, you've got a whole plethora of options. Most of them you've never explored. Most of them you've never thought about. Some of them seem impossible. But I'll remind you that this is the same God who walked two and a half million Israelites up to a Red Sea with the Egyptians right behind them. And they were standing there going, we got no clue. I know God's got a plan. He didn't bring us out of Egypt to kill us in the desert. I don't understand what's happening. And God says, will you guys quiet down? I'm working here. Turn around. There's a Red Sea over there. Okay, start walking. What? Start walking. It's water. We'll drown. Start walking. Because I got this. And it's dry ground. That doesn't happen. Just did. Walk quick. Egyptians are coming. You ever stop and think that the same Christ who in a few chapters later will walk on water could have had them walk across the water? It would have been no big deal. They just wouldn't have done it because it would have freaked them out. So He lets them walk across on dry ground. Looking at the first world class um, aquarium, thank you. Word got away. All I could think of was an observatory, and that wasn't the right word. You know, they're walking. I just say, whoo, that's a big fish. <laughs> Guys, I'm trying not to mock. I'm not trying to make fun. I'm trying to help you to see that the God who created the universe, the God who created the world in six days with a spoken word and never had to get his hands dirty and never had to get up, can solve your itty-bitty problem in ways you have not even imagined. I know it seems overwhelming. I know where you're at may seem like, I, I, I don't know. I just don't know. The solution is to cry out to God and watch for His out. It's why Jesus asked Him to ask us to follow Him. Because He'll lead us into places we didn't think existed. He'll lead us into options we didn't even think about. And He will provide us the resources to make it happen. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for this Word, for this encouragement. We find David in such a precarious position. He's, he's fought so long and now he finds himself in a place where he could lose it all. And I thank You, Lord God, that You provided him that out and allowed him to be the king You wanted him to be. I pray, Lord God, that You would in the same way act in our lives that we might cry out to You and seek Your face and know Your will and follow it. Even when it seems confusing and even when we don't understand that, Lord, we would have the faith in You to step boldly into stuff that is unknown to us. I praise You, Lord God, for this lesson. I know, Lord God, that, that there's a lot of repetition from what I said last week in closing. But Lord, that's what You've paid on my heart, and so evidently we need to hear it. 
You've got this. And we don't need to worry. You've got this. And all we have to do is follow. You've got this. Help us to believe and obey. In Christ's name, Amen. Stand with me if you will. As we close out this morning, we'll do so with a song of praise. If you got business with God, please come. Others will pray with you. I will pray with you. Trust. Obey. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we Hallelujah to the King of Kings, Hallelujah to the Lamb, Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. So I step down there and Mickey shows me her book. She takes notes. And her little notebook has here my Closing, can't say it any better. Psalm 61, verse 2. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. Amen.